Going inside the issues of our community, this is Local 12 Newsmakers. Now we've got a developer who's one of the most prominent in the whole region who's stepping up to the plate. He's kicking in 10 million of his own money. It's a disappointment, but it is not a permanent setback. We have made a great deal of progress on the banks and on the financing of this development. Waterfront development has fueled urban renaissances from Baltimore to Seattle. That's been the hope for the banks in Cincinnati, but getting things beyond pretty pictures continues to frustrate local officials. Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers. Back in June, Hamilton County stepped in and abruptly and, preempti abruptly and preemptively uh, took, a, uh, took over for a variety of organizations that had been trying to get the bank started for several years. That included the City of Cincinnati, the Port Authority, Cincinnati Central City Development Corporation, 3CDC, and all the, uh, the major corporate movers and shakers who are on the boards and connected to those organizations. The county declared that they would work exclusively with CorporEx, headed by Bill Butler, and Vandecor, headed by Rob Simjunis. The entities that were frozen out fussed and fumed, but in the end could do nothing but let the new process play itself out. It did two weeks ago when CorporEx announced it was pulling out of the project. I am joined this morning by Hamilton County Commissioner Phil Heimlich, who has been at the center of the county's steps on the bank's project. Phil, welcome back. Dan, all I can say is seeing those two sound bites of mine back to back, it sounds like one of those opposition political ads, for gosh sakes. Well, maybe we could use it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can you get rid of that tape? <laughs> I think if I found it, somebody else will find it. What's the essential problem that CorporEx ran into? The essential problem, I don't know I'd say it's a problem they ran into, it's really a decision that we made that we could only go so high as far as how much money we were willing to kick in. I think we've all had experience with deals that, specifically deals on the riverfront where looking back the, tax, the taxpayers weren't well served. And as much as we want to get this project going, we could only give so much, it's that simple. Is there any reason to believe given that. And let me say that what I didn't want, as much as I, as much as anyone, want this project done and it, have it the front door of our region, get it going, I didn't want to put ourselves in a position, nor, nor did Pat or Todd, so that we would look back and the taxpayers, you know, would say to us, why did you cut that deal? Why did you give so much? Given that, given that there's this limit, and I don't know, I mean, I'm sure that's a complicated, it's not just a simple number, it's right. all sorts of things. Sure. Is there any reason to believe that another develop? you're now out doing an RFQ, uh, right. searching for a new developer, is there any reason a future developer is going to find it any better than Bill Butler did? First of all, we have had huge interest from local and national developers, fairly prominent ones, just since this setback happened with CorporEx. So the answer is there is strong interest and I am very confident we're going to have a deal very soon with another developer. The important thing to remember is the bank's project is alive and well. It is untrue. But, but having another deal with another developer, unless the pieces are different, what difference does it make? Won't they six months later run into the same thing? Why will they, why will they end up at a different point? I mean, Bill Butler is known as a pretty smart developer. Why will they end up at a different point than he could figure out? We've already had a lot of inquiries from developers who know exactly what the amount of money that we couldn't write the check for was with Bill, and they've said, hey, we're very interested. I mean, just take Rob Smyjunas, who was Bill's partner in this. Right. Bill has said, I want to stay in this deal. The county was being, I, I think- Rob said. Rob said, yeah, as, you, he, remember, he was half the development team. Right. If he felt we were not willing, being generous enough in terms of what we were offering, uh, he wouldn't have stayed in. Now again, I'm not here to knock Bill because I have great respect no, for no, Bill. I, and that's not but the fact of the matter is, just because it didn't work out with one particular company doesn't mean that, that the project is kind of off the tracks. One of the things that you mentioned in that soundbite back from back in June that mm -hmm. I used was right. that uh, the developers were willing to put some of their own money in. And part of what they were willing to do in putting their own money in was create this TIF financing, which back in June, Dennison Keller, who is uh, a reporter here, the, sto mm -hmm. the story he did that day, I thought he was able to explain that very nicely. Let's take a look at what he said back in June. The parking garages should cost about $55 million. The county doesn't have all that money in hand just yet, but with a $10 million in private development, plus another $10 million the county will kick in, they can build that first garage. Then they can develop that land right away. That land then becomes more valuable. It creates its own tax revenue. 
Then with that money, they can build the second garage. Then after that, they can start developing that land as well. But then they use the tax revenue from that land to build the third parking garage. Then pretty soon, all the pieces fall in line. Fall in line or fall over, I'm not sure. Uh, what was wrong with that theory? Nothing, absolutely nothing. Were, were, were they still willing to put their 10 million in? Yes, but without, again, without getting into the details, because I don't think that's fair to either side, there were requests for additional public money that we just couldn't meet. More than we're the, not willing to meet. More than the 10 million that was mentioned here? Yes. Okay. In other words, there was a request for, well, that was the money that uh, Corpex was kicking in. Yeah, but there was also, Denison mentions that the county would also right. put in. There, there were, yes, there were requests for significantly more, and I just, I'll just leave it at that. In the approach that you took back in June, the sort of go it alone, yeah. county's going to take the leadership, we've got, we know how to get this solved and mm -hmm. get out of this mess of all these different competing yeah. organizations. Did you burn a lot of bridges and are you going to put those back, are you going to try to, do you now need 3CDC, the Port Authority, you, obviously the new mayor came over and was very helpful from the beginning, uh, from the very day you had to make this announcement, but what's it going to take to put this back together or do you need to put those community groups back in, together? First point to keep in mind is we had to do what we did because nothing had happened for five years. And I don't mean any disrespect toward those organizations, they got some great people, but for five years the property sat vacant. I think it was right, it, the right thing to do was for us to take the project and get it moving. I can tell you that as far as bridge building goes, the city and the county are working like this. I had a great meeting yesterday with Mayor Mallory. Our staffs and his staff met together, and the two of us sat there at a big table and said, you guys are going to work together. So where, that, are, where are you with the Port Authority? Let me, let me finish answering your question. Okay. The important point is that the key business leaders in this town have indicated to us they have confidence in what we're doing and they support what we're doing. You don't, back in June, you made that announcement without, because I remember talking mm -hmm. to you on this show about it. Right. Uh, you did not go to P&G first, for example. You didn't talk to Charlotte Otto. You didn't talk to A.G. Mm -hmm. Laffley. You didn't talk to a number of those other people. Um, that's pretty tough in this town not to include P&G and the other corporate leaders. You don't think, you, you think they're just willing to come back and work with you now? I can tell you we've had excellent meetings with a number of the people you've mentioned who have really voiced their full support for the project and the way it's moving. Final question on this. Um, we know that tax receipts on state levels across the country are starting to come back up after mm -hmm. the recession. Yeah. Uh, is that happening with the sales tax in Hamilton County? Are you, where, where are we on sales tax income that's very critical for paying for the stadiums and the banks? So far that has not happened, which is why our stadium fund has a deficit of about $190 million and which is why anytime somebody comes up with some spending project or a request for money, I always say, hold it. We are not going to put ourselves in the position the state of Ohio is in, where we're begging for money and raising taxes on everything. It's still a tight squeeze with the sales tax. Okay, so the sales tax hasn't bounced back. Has not bounced back, no. So you're still really squeezed on the banks. I, I would say we are squeezed in the stadium fund, which is one of the reasons that we have our action going with the Cincinnati Bengals. But the point is, Dan, that I have beat this drum quite a bit, that we are not going, we're going to be very tight when it comes to spending money. We're going to be very careful in our spending. We have kept our spending under the rate of inflation for the last three years, and it's going to stay that way. Okay. Let's just shift to another topic that came up this week. We're Can I say one other thing on the sure. banks, if you don't mind? Because I think this is important. It's important to understand the banks is alive and well, and it's important to understand what we have gained in these last six months. It's misleading for anybody to say, oh, you wasted the six well, months negotiating Butler. We, our fiscal plan has put, been put in place. We have lined up $26 million in federal money that was not lined up when we took it over. We have another $20 million that we're very close to. So it, our financial plan has become solidified. How quickly do you have to move on that in order to get that $26 million of federal? There's a lot of competition for federal money right now with the hurricanes, sure. with the war, sure. with the deficits in Washington. How sure. quick can, do you have to move in order to actually get that money that you say you secured? The money is right now secured for the banks. If you're asking how long will they keep it secured, yeah. I can't answer that. But right now it's secured and it's secured for the banks. And let's also understand the strong interest we're getting from developers, local and national, is because it's an excellent location and they like our construction plan for those garages. Okay. 
I want to move on to what has popped up this past week, which is Drake. Okay. And uh, as part of the debate on this, uh, your fellow commissioner, Todd Portoon, had this to say during a commission meeting. Let's take a listen. And first and foremost, what's going on here is the integrity of an election has been attacked by people who did not support the levy and refused to accept the results of the election, period. Phil, you led the fight against that levy a year ago. Why shouldn't we just see this as the voters voted one way, they disagreed with you, and you've spent a year frustrating the will of the voters? Well, what he said there was false. It's false because the money from the tax levy for the next four years is going to Drake. The only difference is it's going to be managed by the Health Alliance. Yeah, you drove so, out. So for Drake. Todd to say, oh, that the voters voted this, they're not getting it, it's just simply false. But what's important is, as you know, because we had a debate right here, the Drake board were the ones opposing me in that tax levy fight. It was the Drake board that came to the Health Alliance and to us and asked us to let the Health Alliance take over. But wasn't that after a year of absolute, you know, nitty gritty warfare over getting any sort of contract that, that the money would actually be released in the way that, in an orderly sort of way? I mean, you were fighting them on every part of their budget. Actually, that's not true, Dan. The difference, the only difference we had was that they wanted 13 million, we said 10.7 million. Wait yeah. a minute now. You were arguing, though. You were, you demanded another um, audit. Uh, you, Which they agreed to. Well, you know, you've got the money. They need the money. I mean, you, you agreed to. It makes it sound like they thought of it. It wasn't their idea. A actually, on the contrary, they liked the idea of having a joint audit sponsored by both. The audit came back and said Drake was fiscally mismanaged, their costs were totally out of line, and they couldn't survive the way they were going. When th that audit came out, that's when the Drake board said, please, let the Health Alliance take over. Think about this. Here I'm going head to head, Chris Finney and I, against the Drake board. The Drake board then comes to us and says, listen, we need this change. We need the Health Alliance to take over to survive. I think it's a great ending of a story, to tell you the truth. When you got Phil Heimlich on the one hand and the leaders of Drake coming together, the only person in this whole community that spoke, was against the deal was Todd Portoon. Nobody else. I mumble on that one a little bit, and I'm out of time. But one connected to this in some ways is the indigent care levy, which is going to be up again next year. Mm -hmm. The recommendation is basically to cut significantly. Um, almost 40 percent from what it has been for the last five years. Uh, will you support that the bulk of that still keeps going to the Health Alliance at University Hospital, or will you be open to a negotiation between now and next November that other hospitals can p take part in that as well? Until I get the final recommendations of the Indigent Care Task Force that's been studying this issue religiously for eight months, I'm not going to make a decision. Okay. I want you to keep one thing in mind on Drake before we, we're out of time. This hospital is going under, would be going under without this change. We have saved the hospital and we have now eliminated the tax after this levy ends. I can't imagine more of a win-win than that. Okay. Thank you, Phil, for being here. And you'll be back on the Indigent Care Levy. <laughs> Believe me. All right. Okay. Stay tuned. <laughs> a report about cancer-causing emissions from a chemical plant in Addison forced an abrupt closure of Hitchens School in Addison last week. After the break, a discussion of what else is at stake. You start thinking, it's, man, well, what are they really pumping into the air? And it gets, it gets scary. Dad, you know, I'm a little, little concerned. On December 6, the Ohio EPA abruptly shut down Hitchens Elementary School in Addiston out of concern for the long-term health implications of admissions from a nearby chemical plant. 
1952, the Monsanto Corporation began manufacturing styrene polymers on the 130-acre riverfront site in the village of Addiston. In 1996, the business was acquired by Bayer, the German-based company that dates back to 1863. In 2004, Bayer spun off Lanxis as its totally independent corporation. Welcome back. The issues involved in this situation go far beyond a single school building. Every resident of Addison is certainly involved, and given the prevailing west to east wind patterns of the Ohio Valley, almost all of us are involved. So what's at stake for the community and the region? To discuss that question, I am joined this morning by Addison Mayor Dan Pillow and Lanx's plant manager Sandy Marshall. Mr. Marshall is a chemical engineer by training and has been at the plant, been the plant manager at Addiston uh, since July. Yes. Welcome to Newsmakers, Dan. Thank you. Uh, glad um, to have us. I gotta tell you, I'm somewhat confused. This happened very abruptly. Ohio, and I know neither of you made this decision, but the Ohio EPA stepped in and closed that school very quickly. Dan, how much lead time did you have on that? Um, I would say approximately a half hour. How about the schools? The schools probably had an hour if I'm remember correctly. How do you interpret the fact that this all happened so quickly? I mean, it's not that the plant's new. It's been there for a long time, exactly. which is what we were, what I was trying to reinforce. Why so quick? Because the emphasis, the announcement is, this is not an immediate problem. Exactly. This is a long-term problem. Why did it happen that way? Well, obviously, that is uh, probably the focal point of my concern and the information that I'm trying to put together. Why did this happen so quickly? Yesterday I spoke with the director of the Ohio EPA to try to get that clarification. Uh, in his estimation, the closing of the school was so that they could do more monitoring within the school, not necessarily because there was a health risk to the children. That was not the initial information that we received. We want to err on the side of caution because there are children involved. So there is still some gray area as to why this happened so quickly. Sandy, I know you've only been here uh, since July, uh, but part of your reason for coming is the, the corporation is making a real effort, and I've talked to some people uh, at your headquarters in Pittsburgh, you know, making a real effort to do the right thing in, in Addiston. Do you see an acute problem here? Do you know something about, is there something that happened that forced this decision by o Ohio EPA? I'm not aware of any specific uh, issue which would have caused this reaction. Uh, there's been monitoring going on on the roof of Hitchin School now for seven months. Uh, they've been picking up very low levels of butadiene and acrylonitrile levels on those monitors on the roof, uh, but they're in the very low part per billion level. Uh, the monitors on the roof of Hitchens were brought into play based on three uh, events we had last year, which caused uh, a lot of community attention at that time. Events meaning releases? Yes, there was three. Uh, uncontrolled uh, releases? Yes, three uncontrolled releases uh, had happened at that point in time, which brought attention to the community uh, that started this uh, process. You mentioned what these, re you know, what it was that was they were monitoring for, and I'd never be able to pronounce it again. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but what are we talking about? What is produced at the plant that is a concern from a health point of view? Well, we make what's called uh, ABS polymers. These are polymers that are common plastics, which are commonly used. And the three main monomers or chemicals that are used to produce those are acrylonitrile, butadiene, and styrene. Uh, acrylonitrile and butadiene are, uh, are potential carcinogens, and they've been the focus of this study. Okay. Has there been a long-term concern in the community ab about the health issues connected to this plant. Before it was Lanx's, when it was Bayer, when it was Monsanto. Sure. Has, has there been a long-term concern on the community's level? Oh, absolutely. I, I can't speak as to um, everyone who has sat in the mayor's seat, but in the community in general, sure, there is a concern when you have a chemical plant in, in your backyard. There are certain innuendos, but there, to, in my estimation, has never been a real study. Uh, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, there are all kinds of studies being done and uh, uh, for the 52 years. To what there. extent um, Ohio Citizen Action, which is an environmental group, mm -hmm. came into the community almost a year ago, I guess, yes, and, and started focusing on this. Did they spark 
a lot of this uh, effort? You know, you're saying all these studies now. Sure, absolutely. Uh, yes, I absolutely give them uh, credit for coming into the community and making us aware because we were not aware of some of the, some of the releases okay. that had taken place at that time. But they did. They did uh, begin the ball rolling. In talking to people at Ohio Citizen Action, on the other hand, Sandy, I have to tell you that they feel like the plant has made some significant changes and they're very happy with what's going on there now. And they've pulled out of their campaign. Absolutely. So what's your, how do you see that sort of grassroots environmental organization? Well, I, I agree with Dan that Ohio Citizen Action coming in last year certainly raised the awareness of this issue and got it into the community and into the public's eye. And uh, over the course of, of the campaign, they continued to raise awareness. Uh, and so uh, from that standpoint, they, were, they uh, played a role in that. As we've moved through the course of this year, I feel very confident and comfortable that they've validated to some degree the steps we're taking and uh, the announcements that we made in July and again in September to invest two and a half million dollars to improve our, our performance and further reduce our emissions uh, were important steps. And also uh, in my discussions with Ohio Citizen Action, the management commitment we were making to the community, the work we were doing with the community and the task force that Dan Pillow co uh, leads with, uh, with State Representative uh, Steve Driehaus have been a very uh, has been very positive and on the heels of those announcements Ohio Citizen Action recognized the positive uh, changes uh, and improvements we were making and have became a, a positive partner in, uh, in resolving and Let's take forward. a look at some statistics from Langsys' website about trend lines and the first one is over a period of time sort of a chronological time in terms of um, toxic release inventory, you can see it here on yes. the screen. Mm -hmm. This start, and it's hard to see, but it starts in 1987 and goes up through 2003. How would you interpret that, Sandy? Well, I think that that certainly shows the commitment that uh, Lanxus, Monsanto, Bayer have made over the years to improve the performance. If you uh, look at the downward trend there, there's been over a 70% reduction in, in uh, toxic emissions over the last approximately 20 years. There is a couple of key points there. The one I would like to talk to is the thermal oxidizer project that was installed in late 1992 by Monsanto. That was a voluntary uh, a project uh, that they put in and basically the thermal oxidizer uh, burns and destroys fugitive emissions from the plant and that was done uh, voluntarily. And you can see from that graph that it caused quite a significant step change at that time. We have a second graph which is a pie chart focusing on 2003 um, TRI breakdown, and I don't want to get into all of the details, but is this basic, the way I read this is, there's still a lot to do though. The well, trend line has been down, but you still have issues. Yes, absolutely. We have uh, ways to further reduce our emissions here. Uh, but this is not a compliance issue per se. This is, uh, uh, when you do look at the data, the, the green and the red part of this pie, represents 55% of the total emissions, and those are the VOC uh, emissions that uh, are the focus of, of what we're talking about today. The thing that I find very uh, uh, positive about this graph is the wastewater treatment portion of that pie has been a uh, particular focus, and there's an investment that was installed in June, which certainly impacts this, and we talked, uh, announced in September some further work we're doing around biofilter trials, which will address that as well. The other investments we've talked about are, uh, are aimed at tackling the green portion of that pie, the 30 percent. And those aren't, the impact of that new technology isn't reflected in this pie chart. This Absolutely is This not. is 2003 numbers. Dan, what's your experience with working with Lanxis? Let's not go all the way back to the, <laughs> the, the other companies, but Absolutely. right now, what, from a community leader's point of view, what's been your experience of working with a corporation? Very important point. Um, Approximately three weeks ago, I met with Han, Hans Kognickel, who is, I'm not sure of his title, but he's the Vice President of Worldwide Operations. Sounds from big Germ to me. From Germany, uh, Worldwide Operations. At that point, and this, I've met with him on two separate occasions, he told me that he is committed to our community. 
to improve air emissions and the quality of life in our community. I take that very seriously coming from the top of, of the uh, corporation. And uh, uh, I believe that his, uh, his word is good. I, I think he's gonna do that. From a mayor's perspective too, there's another side of this. I mean, Absolutely. there's the environmental side. There's also the job side. This sure. plant has been under its various guises, <laughs> has, has been very important to Addiston over the decades. You don't want to see this close up either, do you? Well, certainly not, especially with the strides that we've made. Obviously, you looked at the charts. There is a line of improvement. Uh, why would we want to get rid of a plant who is improving versus what we have lived with for the past 50 years uh, where uh, or beyond this there weren't any emissions? Or, or weren't any records of the emissions in the 80s, I'm sorry. Okay, unfortunately, mm -hmm. I'm just about out of time. Thank you for being here. Thanks for continuing to work on this. When there, we'll see how this goes, and we'll maybe have you back. So, great. Thank you for making Local 12 Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Next week is Christmas morning. I'll be joined by Episcopal Bishop Herbert Thompson, who will retire after 17 years of service and community involvement here in Cincinnati. Have a good week. <laughs>